colleagues, fellow citizens, I've taken the liberty to address the press today to cover a number of areas very briefly but succinctly so we can keep the nation abreast of certain important developments that need our fellow citizens to know where government stands on those issues, their government. The first issue I want to deal with is that of national unity. National unity. We have a heritage as a people, as a country, a heritage which incorporates many of us who may look different in height. Does it matter? No. In complexion, does it matter? No, it doesn't. Many of us may twist our tongues when we speak differently. Languages, does it matter? Absolutely not, because that's a gift from God. We always just find ourselves in there. I want to see a child who chooses parentage. Before they are conceived, they say, me, I want my parents to be Mr. X as my father and Madam Y as my mother. They're not conceived. Is that possible? No. So who our parents are, who or where they live is not our choice. I must also be specific. How they go to know each other, we never know because we're not there. But we are a product of love. We are a product of love not hatred. We are made in the image of God and no one else. It's very important. Fellow citizens, I don't comment when things happen anyhow. I have quite some patience and quite some tolerance levels of patience and tolerance are quite high especially a guy like me who went through a lot to stand here as a head of state i probably went through the worst discrimination any citizen can receive from his own or her own citizens i went through the west records are there when you experience what i've experienced you learn to be patient you learn to be tolerant you also sometimes learn to ignore certain things until when it's right to speak or to say something or respond in a certain way. And I believe over years now, over months and days, putting all the things that have been going on together around this attack, insistent attack on national unity, on our heritage, on our unity and diversity, something we inherited from those that came before us. Some are gone, KK and his group are gone. Some are still alive, a very small number, freedom fighters. we have an obligation to address this issue squarely. 
and not to skate around. Driven on the platform or the understanding that no one, and really no one, should be allowed to divide this country. It's a heritage we are proud of. 72, 73 ethnic groups. Some will like to argue that now there are 70, no, some are close, there, there are 30, there, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. The message is that it's a heritage. When this country was put together as a republic, others came from my, the north, migrated from the north. Others migrated from the south. Others from the east, west. Others moved longer distances over many years. Others short. At the time, the country was pronounced as independent Zambia. It did not matter how long you traveled to sit in this geography, 752,000 square kilometers of land, eight plus one neighbors. It doesn't matter what agreements existed with the BSA company, Cecil Rhodes, with the Crown of England, with anyone else. It did not matter. A pronouncement was made that this board of citizens, this board of people, from now on going forward, will be called citizens of Zambia. Full stop. And the Constitution is very clear that there's no one citizen who is superior to the other. I repeat, there's no one citizen, not even a group, that is superior to others. Where's the reference point? The Constitution. It is there. In my difficult days, when others made it clear that I was not allowed to be president of Zambia, and that they will use everything at their disposal, all the force they had at their disposal, including the military at the time, my answer was dual. Two. One, I would say to those, go and change the constitution. You don't want this fellow, fellow citizen to be head of state? Go and change the constitution. It's the only justification that will allow you to talk that language, that divisive language. Two, you are not God. Therefore, you cannot say those things. And I maintain that posture. The rest is history. What has been happening in our country over years, over months, over days, is not acceptable. Divisive talk, adults meet, organized to meet, to spew hatred against fellow citizens, to sow seeds of divisions against fellow citizens. Indeed, that is weird. In a Christian country, inside the church, really, the sacred house of God, you are spewing hatred. You are proud to say that you are a violent man. You are a violent man inside the church. There's a contradiction in a Christian nation. And others are clapping. Honestly, we should say no to such things. To say these must stay there, those must stay there, what God put together, no one puts asunder. Honestly speaking, adults, 
grown-ups, incredible. As your chief servant, I'm here to say that behavior, that language, proudly says, me, I can hurt people. I'm violent. That's disgusting. To say the least, that's disgusting. From whichever angle you want to look at it, that's disgusting. And it should have no place in our society, in our country. And none of us should clap for such behaviors. None of us. We shouldn't teach children, our children, hatred. We should teach our children love and accommodation. That's what we should teach our children. If you're a responsible parent, you teach your children love, tolerance, diversity, unity in diversity. Honestly speaking. And I urge the people of Zambia, we should not clap for such. We should not encourage lunacy. That's lunacy. If our forefathers behaved like that, we'd have never had independence. Some of you are young. Political parties, we were a multi-party state at independence. Not a one-party state. First election, there was no absolute winner to form government. Three parties emerged. European Party, two liberation parties, UNIP and ANC. Two out of these three needed to come together to form government, despite their differences in policies. UNIP under KK, ANC under Nkumbula, one was socialist orientated, one was market best in national interest. They came together. That's great. That's how it should be. Sixty years later, others are pulling away. No. We shouldn't teach our children bad manners at dinner tables, divisive and angry hearts. Cabinet met yesterday to arrest this issue and do it decisively. Cabinet met yesterday and resolved to amend all laws which flow out of the Constitution, amend all those laws that have to do with discrimination of this nature, as we have experienced in an ugly way, and bring about amendments that will stiffen penalties and make it unattractive for anyone, anyone, to spew hatred against fellow citizens. I must actually say against humanity. Reflect on Rwanda, genocide. Started like this, just like this. Kids thought it was normal to say, find a Tusi, kill them. You are who to find a Tusi, kill them. Became normal. The churches got involved. The churches, the board of Christ got involved in spewing hatred and funding weapons of murder. Go to Rwanda and look at the museum there. I'm happy to sponsor all those that met to spew hatred which could lead to civil strife. Not from government resources but from my own farming resources to send them to Rwanda for a study tour to understand 
that there's no price you can attribute on such behavior. So to forestall that once and for all, the laws yesterday, cabinet passed a cabinet memo to allow the amendment of the laws so that anyone who does that goes in for a long time, for a very long time. So it will be unattractive. Parliament opens, that law will be tabled and it will be enacted. So we call on Parliament, I recognize members of Parliament are also seated here. I should have acknowledged you. Parliament is expected to do what is right, to pass that law or those laws. That's my message, fellow citizens. It's my duty, it's our duty to do what is right. For me, I thought colleagues would change. After a while, they've refused to change. So you have only one way. When you cannot negotiate, you have to use the law to moderate people who are excessive. So, You have heard head speech against fellow citizens. Then you choose to go inside there. You are lucky that there will be mattresses for you. This government has brought mattresses and beds, but it's not the same. Next, rule of law rule of law. Rule of law. And as I touch on the rule of law, just to reinforce other measures that the school curricula, we also agreed yesterday in the cabinet, I beg your pardon, that the school curricula will now take into account the importance of teaching children from an early age national unit. Our values as a country, as a nation. And that the country comes first. We take care of the country's needs, our needs will be taken care of. Not the other way around. School curricula. Cabinet resolved yesterday that subjects or topics will be orchestrated around there. At least we can save the younger generation. Some of the older ones are gone, they're finished. They're polluted, their heads are polluted. But the only way to deal with them is prosecution and jail. That's it. But for the young ones who we care for most, we can breed a group of citizens that love each other that support each other. After all, you are married to each other. Me, I don't know where, why people would pretend when they're in politics away from the bedroom. You marry people from anywhere. On the copper boat in church, I gave an example that here on the copper boat, then I was on the copper boat. You have a husband, member, married to a Tonga woman, and they produce three children. Follow this example carefully. Not four, three. Now, who is of the three children, who is Bemba? Who is Tonga? Of the three children. Who is neither of the two? So one is Bemba, one is Tonga, another one, you have to cut them in the middle, to be fair, to share. Really, as you sit here, ask yourself a question. Is that how we should live? Engoni marries Enamwanga. Elambia, many of you don't know that we have 
land your group in this country because you are too proud to respect others. That's a weakness. A Lambia marries a lousy woman. Who do you call those children? Let me give you my own example. Most of you are not aware. My wife is Sala, Soli, Lenje, and Lamba. Four. Soli, Sala, Lenje, Lamba. Me, I'm Ila and Tonga. So that's six. So what are my three children now? What do we call them? Honestly, this is disgraceful. Other measures will be taken into account to reinforce this issue. Rule of law. We were elected as a government 2021. Amongst the measures we said public land campaigned was that we will restore the rule of law. We campaigned on that platform. We will restore the rule of law. We will not allow hooliganism. We would not allow thuggery of what we experienced 10 years earlier, particularly seven years. We didn't see that under President Sata's three years. May he so rest in peace. One person took over to complete that 10-year term through elections. It was thuggery. It was brutality. It was bloodshed. One person who works for APSA told me, Mr. President, we couldn't wear our APSA uniform, which is red, going to the office. We would have to put it in the bag, wear something else, maybe green. And when we reach the bank, we go in the toilet and change and wear our red uniform. APSA or Zanako, for that matter. Have we forgotten? Have we forgotten, fellow citizens, so quickly? Natulavakale, Fialestika, Kunumako. Not too distant, but baby. That's what we members say. But I'm saying, have we forgotten what was happening behind us? Not far behind, just very near. That some of us couldn't use airports, couldn't go to church, couldn't go to traditional ceremonies. Ngawaya nishiluburi, shivaku puma, sana. Mulopa was a normal thing. Blood was a normal thing in the markets daily. That intercity blood was normal. Simpson building around there, it was normal. Have we forgotten, colleagues? And one of our commitments to the people of Zambia was when you put us in office, we will restore order and the rule of law. I am here to stand, and I stand here, so to say, to reinforce that position. Again, I told you, don't misunderstand my patience to mean I'm unaware. No. That would be a grave mistake, completely grave mistake. We are aware, we are monitoring. Those who orchestrated violence are missing something. I'm aware. Those who emulated the violent ones are also missing Thakari, I can see. I'm watching, I'm looking, as you are doing yourselves. But I'm here to say to you, that thuggery, that violence, even when old habits die hard, even when thugs mutate from one political party to another, to continue their journey of violence, I'm here to tell you that. That will not be allowed. 
that will not be tolerated. Absolutely not. If we need to reinforce the laws, we'll do that. But I think for now, the laws that are there are very clear that violence is not part of us. And therefore, the police do not need my reminder. Law enforcement agencies is not there to negotiate. You are not there to negotiate whether to arrest somebody or to put them in. When they turn violent, they become thugs in public roads or in other places. You don't need the president to give you a call. You don't need the minister of home affairs and internal security to give you a call to remind you to enforce the law. Let me draw the distinction. At that point, negotiations are only done in the communities about which law should be amended or enforced. Choose your own language or expression. In Parliament, you negotiate, you reach out to other MPs, can we amend this law? But as for the police and law, other law enforcement, there is no negotiations. You just enforce the law. There's no negotiation. That's not your role. You want someone to negotiate, pass it to Parliament. And let the parliamentarians lobby each other. Yours is to enforce the law. If you fail to enforce the law, it will be an admittance of failure to perform your duties. Hepela. Kwamana. I know what was happening before. I know one thug who went into central police and beat the hell out of the policeman and was never put behind bars. No one in any political party, in any political party, in any church, no matter how big that church is or small, will be allowed to enter a police station and beat policemen and get away with it. Actually, we are looking at that case now. I want that case to come back. I problem? So hear me out, fellow citizens. You will not hide behind the political party. You will not hide behind the church. Inside the church, all outside the church. You will not hide behind a civil society membership or oasis or anything. That will not protect you. You break the law, the police take you. No negotiations. Those guys who were doing thuggery yesterday went to bury a colleague may so rest in peace, and from the burial site, all before, started harassing people, throwing obscenities at innocent road users. I'm expecting each and every one of them to be arrested. <laughs> you can't claim to do that in the name of supporting HH. I call a man. Uh -uh, no. You can't claim that if you get arrested, you will not vote for HH in 2026. Maybe I don't need your vote. I don't want to be a president who is produced by thugs and turn me into a thug. I call a No. And anyone in politics in the church, in the civil society, in the HH home, 
orchestrating, planning violence, you're on your own. I repeat what I've said. If the police are failing, I'll use the army. That's my job. That's the constitutional rights that the head of state who is the commander in chief, if the police fail to discharge their duties, I'll use the military to restore law and order. But the police must ensure that under the law enforcement, we don't go that far. But I can assure you, if you claim you support a genuine support of HH, who has been preaching peace, you can't go in the streets and start beating people. I know we are being provoked. Let me say something here. Once one colleague went into the market and walked around, where there was peace in the markets, now members in the same market started turning on each other. Are you surprised? Why? Because he encouraged that. And if you call that democracy, democratic space, I disagree with you. I totally disagree with you. And no one is above the law. I hear people talk about immunity, immunity. Why are you talking about immunity? The immunity of the head of state is only relevant during the time they are in the presidency. The crimes they commit outside the presidency is not covered by that immunity. That's the law. So why are you talking about immunity? I don't understand. One person goes in the market days, in fact, the same day, members of the same society and market start fighting. Next, we see pangas. We see sticks. So now, for some young people, they're saying, oh, ho, so this bloodletting is coming back now. We must defend ourselves. And they shout on social media, and I'm listening, that this president did not allow us to revenge in 2021. That's why I'm with you, but I disagree. That's why I did not allow revenge or avenging in on the 16th of August, 2021. If I allowed that, this country would have been in smoke. What country would I want to rule when the country is in smoke? Am I a leader? I am not. I stand by that. And I want to ask UPND members to accept the position of this fellow, to protect every citizen. Now that we did that, we don't also expect anyone else to provoke the citizens and start engineering and recurrence of those memories, brutal memories. No. No one will be allowed to do that. No one. Police, you got my message. I repeat, all those that disturbed, harassed public, the public, damaged someone's property yesterday, we expect them to be arrested. <laughs> those two who are wanting to take us back to the rivers of blood, you will be arrested as well. If you scheme things that don't exist to malign people, well, you're on your own. Those who give sympathy to such people, you will just stand and look because you have no ability to stop them from being thrown in and prosecuted. And prosecutions must be expeditious. I think the point is well made, loud and clear. Very loud and clear. Judiciary must play their part. We all play our part. 
the executive will play its part. Colleagues, third issue is fight against corruption. Fight against corruption. The fight will continue. Very straight and clear. The fight against corruption shall continue. Actually, we are now more ready than before. We have amended the laws, three or so pieces of legislation that were standing in the way. We have created the Economic and Financial Crimes Court, dedicated prosecutions. We have also amended the practicing procedures. You already know this, I'm reminding you, the nation, that any such crimes will be prosecuted within five months. If you were banking that you can survive for another 20 years and there will be another government, you have missed the shot. Within five months, the prosecutions will be done. Of course, after due investigations, as I've always said, no arresting innocent people, investigate first, arrest, prosecute, court within five months. I can see the jitters. I can see the panic. I feel it. That's why there's this carelessness you are seeing now, threatening people. Honestly, you were threatening people when you were in government. You are outside government. You are still threatening people. Bushir, what sort of thinking is that? Even if you are a violent man, what sort of thinking is that? Now, those you threatened when they were outside government and they're in government, uh, you believe they're standing on the same position? Honestly? That is unfortunate. Why should we threaten each other? Let's talk to each other. Let's dialogue. Let's talk to each other. But the fight against corruption continues two angles. Asset recovery. There is no turning back. Asset recovery, restore the money to the owners. Children need desks, that's their money. We need medicines in hospitals. We need, Minister of Finance is here, we need to increase CDF even more. It's doing wonders. That was the money which was being stolen. Now it's available for CDF to train kids at his skills, to send children to boarding schools, those who are not able to afford parents, so to say, to pay retirees. That's why we need to asset recover. Colleagues, the next arm is prosecution. I've heard people saying, no, 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 asset recovery is, uh, is not enough. Two things, asset recovery and prosecutions, which will lead to acquittal or conviction. Conviction, you go in. So you lose the money you store, so you don't buy expensive lawyers. Then you go in. You're fortunate that this government has bought mattresses because we're human beings. We're not animals. We're human beings, respecting the rights of people, even those in detention or in correctional services. That's my message. No one will use language to escape the fight against corruption. Corruption of today, tomorrow, yesterday, today, tomorrow. No one. You can't escape by saying, I'm a member of a political party. No. You can't escape by saying, because of my tribe. This smelly stuff, which we keep propagating. Yet when you fall in love with a beautiful woman, you don't ask what language they speak. You just marry. Can you see what nature does? Nature drives you to do the right things. How can you hate where you love? 
It's not possible. No religion will protect any corrupt. As I said about criminality, no religion will protect a criminal. If you are an Adventist like me, and you steal public resources, me, the elder, will work to put you inside. Yes. I'm the elder in the church. Me, the elder, I will work very hard to put you in and take away the money you took from the people. That goes for any church. And please, churches, don't stand for the corrupt and stroke religious emotions. No. When people steal, they don't steal for the church. They don't steal for the tribe. They steal because of their greed. Simple. So that's all. I have nothing more to say around the fight against corruption. It will continue. We are better placed now. We've also done our benchmarking. We've signed various agreements with international parties. Our job will be more effective now than before. We've done our homework in the last two years. That's why you are seeing more recoveries now. I'm sure you've noted the trend has changed. More recoveries. And we will push that hard. There's no room for theft, petty or large scale. And by the way, Cabinet yesterday agree, again agreed to increase the penalties for those that steal from the people. For those that pull away electric cables, for those that vandalize public assets, private assets, you go in for a longer period. We want a country where corruption, theft is not tolerated. Investments will come from fellow citizens. If you invest in a center pivot, one hectare center pivot, which is what we are promoting, a crank comes in the night and steals the motor. And that center pivot, one hectare center pivot, is owned by a widow who got support from CDF or from CEC or indeed under the disaster. And I'm going to talk about it. And the center people is gone. Food security is gone. Why should we promote such people in our country? Actually, there's no line. People say there's a thin line between the corruptor and the thieves. No, it's one and the same. It's the same coin. You just flip it. Right? Fellow citizens, disaster and emergence. We declare the disaster and emergence early on. Ahead of the pack. That's what leadership is, not to wait for the pack. The drought we've never seen in memory. That's a phenomenon of God or nature. It isn't man-made. Climate change, yes, you can say it's instigated by pollution, yes. But really, which country receives rain, which doesn't receive rain, is not a decision of any particular leader or government or people. We get afflicted. And we declared this drought, which has caused food insecurity, energy insecurity, transcending into economic, potential economic shutdown when there's no energy as a disaster and emergence. Our focus is dual. One, to feed the people, to feed fellow citizens. No one should die of hunger. And all of us, Secretary of the Cabinet, we left State House yesterday around 22, 23 hours to make sure that we secure food for all our people in the 84 districts determined by science, by research, that there is a drought. Food must move to our people. Reverse order, 
where FRA buys maize from, we are taking maize back to those depots, closer to the people. Very clear agenda. And your government, ministers, cabinet, permanent secretaries, this is the time we work double shift. Procurement people, please don't sit on decisions because you are looking for something. You will be in line for trouble. We were here up to 22, 23 hours last night to make decisions, to move, bring in enough maize, to mop the maize from different corners within the country and elsewhere and move it. Food for work at a lower price, enhanced social cash transfer to support our people so they don't die of hunger. This is a big program. It's a national program. It's not a UPND government or alliance program. It's a national program. All of us must support it. And if we start petting, encouraging people to fight in the markets instead of focusing on the drought, what sort of leaders are we? Honestly speaking, really? The second arm is to increase, improve our resilience. When the drought hits us next, we should be better prepared in many ways. One, we must water harvest for irrigation, for productivity improvement. At least when we irrigate, one center people was talking about, solar energy, whatever source of energy, that's what we're working on. Colleagues in energy, we have a meeting this week, Friday, to assess the progress we're making so that we don't have an economic shutdown. as colleagues in water. Again, yesterday in the cabinet meeting, we took decisions on energy, on water, to alleviate the food insecurity situation, the energy insecurity, the threat on the economic activity. Power must be available to irrigators so we can produce food, even in the dry season. That's a serious problem. We need everybody's hands and brain ideas, and they are all welcome. So, if that is what is preoccupying us, why should we now be digressed by lawlessness, by sowing seeds of pangas again in the markets, reminding the youth of what it was just two years, 11 months ago, Human nature is that people react. Say, oh, yayamba foot in the omanj. Uyungata bwera yayamba in the wap. And people react that way. We shouldn't do those things. Let's focus on feeding the people and working on irrigation. I'm not saying we shut down democracy. It's not what I'm saying. It's what someone who writes that the president said shut down democracy. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we must understand our priorities. We must understand the need to maintain the rule of law. We must understand the need to fight corruption. That's what I'm saying. My message is simple and clear. So I ask the whole government machinery, we're working with the civil society, we're working with the church, those who have capacity to distribute, we are working with them. If you know an institution you are associated with which has experienced knowledge of distribution of food to the vulnerable, Cabinet Office is there, DMMU is there as a team who will enlist that, that organization. Women organizations, as I said, church, civil society, international organizations. We are working with the UN system here. I think that's our responsibility. God says, 
I put you in charge at a particular time, not your choosing, but my choosing. That's God. And when I do that, I will not give you a load you cannot carry. You will be able to carry it. But for us to carry that load, we must be organized. We must work together. We must not throw money or allow it to be stolen. Because we need every penny to now avail food and irrigation for our people. That's the message. We ask the country to support this agenda. Storage. All of those things. We shouldn't be able to have no food one season. We should now invest in storage, and we're doing that. We're budgeted for it now. It's going to happen. It may take time, but it will happen. I want to assure citizens. Lastly, rebuilding the economy. That's our agenda. In the last two years, eight, nine months, you can see as citizens that this is the agenda of this government. To rebuild the run-down economy. Strangely, those who are constraining and standing in the way are the very people who damage the economy. How ironic can that be? You mess up the well, the only well where the whole country draws water from, and you walk away because you took some benefits for yourself, but the country has no water, community has no water. Some team comes along, they are cleaning the water. You climb the anti-hill. No, they have failed to clean the water. Why did you mess it up in the first place? If you are a serious human being, you should have never messed up that well. The resources we, little we have, we should have been using to build more wells. You, you messed up in the well. Sometimes we must have a bit of shame. Husbands, wives, wives, talk to your husbands when they, they mess up badly. Husbands, talk to your wives when they mess up badly. Quietly, render some advice. Bashvantu, apamule endela, ah, te pasumam. Mayo, Banae Church, Apayo. That's what decent human beings do. When you clap for such behavior, you are emboldening bad behavior. You are emboldening that. Really? Yes. So we have been working to clean this well so the Zambian people can have clean water, which is not polluted. This effort requires support. We inherited a big debt. Today we stand here. As we were working to clean up the debt mountain, where the debt went up, the economy went down. This doesn't work. In my little training, when the liability goes up, the asset goes up. Then the two can balance. So the asset went down, the liability went up. You don't have to be trained in this field. You will know there's a problem here. And our duty has been to dismantle the debt, debt restructuring. And colleagues have been saying, no, no, it's not possible. They will never make it. Can you tell them, tell Situmbeko, HH, tell Situmbeko to look at plan B and plan C, because you will never achieve debt restructuring. Do you blame them? Maybe you shouldn't. If they had the capacity, they would have never left us with that debt. One, two they would have cleaned up the debt themselves. They dumped it, left it. And today I stand here to say we've made so much progress on the debt restructuring. A few days ago, the bondholders voted overwhelmingly to support the debt restructuring component to deal with the bondholders. That should be a celebration point. Yesterday, the IMF 
in a program with us, our program, which we invited the IMF to support us. Do six monthly reviews, correct me if I'm wrong, six monthly reviews. They came for a review with all the challenges we have. Yesterday, they confirmed that we passed yet again that test and the program of support to us in our restructuring of our economy, our finances will continue. <laughs> this is what the nation must rally around. The whole nation must rally around this, especially that Honestly speaking, I'm not, we're not the ones, but we take responsibility. You see how mature we are? We take responsibility. This is a rallying point. Shouldn't be a divisive point. What else? Minister of Finance. We made a call for an additional support of how much? Within the fund program. An extra three, they were supposed to only release how much? 188, because of the appeal we made following the circumstances we faced, including the drought. That's why we declared the disaster and emergency early on, proactively. They've now been able to extend almost another 400 million, almost 400 million dollars. That was decided yesterday. Now, honestly, even if you have a hatred of fellow citizens, is that a source of hatred? Is that where you drive hatred to them, working like that? You don't. So we will continue within the drought environment, food insecurity, energy insecurity. We will continue working hard to rebuild this economy because we know that's where the solution is. Yes, it's painful. Absolutely. And we understand. We're working on many variables. Long hours, but also efficient working. When work has to be done, we have to do it. Ministers, cabinet office, permanent secretaries. That's why we are in this public office. When work calls, we have to do the work in the interest of the people of Zambia. In Livingston, a few days ago, I said something there. It was a summit of five countries, five heads of state. Namibia, Angola, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. And I was chairing that summit of my colleague presidents and technical staff. And I said, I used the phraseology that we must change the way we work in the public sector. We shouldn't call working to mean eight hours to 17 hours, then we say we have worked. I said no. The fact that you are in office from eight hours to 17 hours, it is not true to, to imply that you have been working. Maybe you have been hanging around. That is true. That's my core. We need to work hard. We need to focus on deliverables. Work hard and focus on deliverables. Then we will help the people. We will help the children in school. Those who are faced with hunger and water shortages, by the way. We will continue working. Please, I make a call to the drillers. You cannot charge those amounts during a drought situation. I have a debt with you. You heard what I said. I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. A boho that should cost 35,000 kwacha. Colleagues in the public sector, in the procurement units, are trying to book those bohos for three, 400,000 kwacha. When you remove you, you say, no, tribalism. You say, no, 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 no. Because I don't belong to their church. That's what you, you like saying. A boho for 30. Thousand kwacha must be thirty-five thousand kwacha, not two hundred thousand. 
That's a departure point. In the time of drought, you do those shenanigans, that's a departure point. Uh -huh. You say, he has said that before. Watch this verse. My choice is now clear. Two and a half years, two years, nine months, I wanted to accommodate people to get them to change. I have now seen they've refused to change. That's a departure point. <laughs> what else can I do? I'm a lover of national unit. I'm a tolerant person. But when you don't want to do what you should do and you want to hide behind ethnicity or church or civil society or anything else, that's a departure point. You will see a few exits from this hour. Don't call me names. Tell those people they should have done their work for the good of the people of Zambia. Don't look at me. Look at them. Give them counsel. A tender committee in a ministry insists that one ball plus accessory should be half a million. Half a million. When you can do it, boho plus accessories, 80,000. People want to charge half a million, 500,000. Kiss come on. Nivuto, Banji. Zambians, learn to distinguish between a victim and an aggressor. A person who behaves like that is the aggressor. They shouldn't come to you pretending they're victims. No, they're not. My management style is that I tell you I'm coming your way. There's no hiding. I actually tell you I'm coming your way. You don't want to do the right things, I'm coming. I think that's a fair way. I, I started practicing this management style from the age 27. I can't change now. But many a time, you think that, oh, he's not aware. <laughs> I'm very much alive. I'm aware. But the idea is to build. If you're a true leader, a true manager, you try and build people. But now I know they've refused to change. So, we will continue working to build this economy. We want to now begin to see the benefits of the debt restructuring coming through. If it were not for the drought, this year we were going to harvest over probably close to 5 million tons. Zambians responded to our call. I'm told even those who work for saloons even cultivated half an acre. You know what I mean. I was proud of all of you, and thank you for answering the call. But God had a reason to allow the drought. Slapping us in the face, irrigate, 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 be more efficient. And we're working on that. Many government programs will continue, colleagues, to reconstruct our economy, to create jobs, more than public sector jobs. We want to see the private sector creating jobs. And some of my friends in the private sector were looking for quick fixes. Actually, I realized that people's ambitions sometimes meet somewhere between the crooks and those who pretend to be genuine businessmen because they wanted shortcuts, things given to them. We can't give you things if we don't have any. That's why we needed to restructure the debt. That's why we need to grow the economy. Just come on board. The old habits, you see what colleagues were doing? They wanted the old habits that, like violence to go away and corruption, but they continue doing the bad things, such as what? Getting contracts to supply air. Ah, uh, no, 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 that's not business. That's not business. So you hear a bit of noise here and there, it's a reconstruction process. We shall be okay. Even with a drought, we shall overcome. We work together, we work harder. The million meal price, issues of fuel, they're sitting right in my head every day. I pull them and look at them every day, agonizing, seek expertise, 
inside, outside. We're working on these issues from all fronts. As I said, if it were not for the drought, would have got surplus maize, the issue of milling mill would have never been an issue. But please accept that this is beyond our control. In economics, we say that's an exogenous variable. It's outside our control. But we still work hard using the endogenous variables, those that are within our control. But we never give up. It's a temporal situation. Fellow citizens, time is now to get a bit more serious with the way we do things in this country. There's too much noise. Social media, just noise, just noise, too much noise. That noise will not solve problems. You have suggestions, bring them to the table. You want to go in the streets? No. You'll find me standing in front of you. You want to break people's properties? No. You have ideas? You are welcome. You want to irrigate an acre? You are welcome. FISIP, CDF, number two, number three, civil service financing scheme. We've lowered the interest, correct me if I'm wrong, from 18% to 9% to allow those even in the public sector to borrow money at a lower cost to produce something. Imagine if just 5 million of us out of 20 million just planted a one hectare, just one hectare, even as a family, 5 million families, just a hectare. And each one of us in a hectare produced 200 bucks. I've worked the numbers, so I'm pulling these figures. 200 bags multiplied by 5 million families. The answer is there. We need to work. We shouldn't spend... People start posting stuff on social media, zero four. Zero four. And one post, a lie is posted, then is extrapolated by seven hours, it's taken as a, a truth. As you know, lies move faster, isn't it? But they have short legs. Eh? Eventually, you get caught. You scheme, you get caught. I want to close by saying to you, you were gassing people. We have now decided to do a formal investigation who was gassing people for what reason. I can confirm to you what I said in Kapiri over the launch of Lusaka and Dollar Highway that a forensic audit is now just being defined nicely, the scope of work, a rolling audit for that matter. We look at Lusaka and Dollar Road, who paid who $30 million which account did it come from, where did it go, who collected it, what did they use it for, since there was not even one meter of the road done. That audit is coming, and Zambians, I want to promise you, we will do everything to recover that money and use it to feed our people who are faced with hunger. What else are we doing? I'm confirming to you here that the tribunal on how the loans were acquired just the principle, the decisions made, I'm going to use a constitutional right or law called the Inquiries Act, and the draft terms of reference have already been done. And I'll be approving them. And any other processes of this parliament, we are in business. And no one should come to you to cry that, no, I'm being victimized. No, my democratic space is taken. Uh-uh. We need to pass away. Look, colleagues, let me, be, let me just cite my example. When I was being accused of things in opposition, I stood openly and said, if any one of you know that I stole something, please go and report to the police station. I encourage citizens, even my tormentors, even those who declare that 
they will lock me up until I die in public. I challenged that friend. I said, why are you threatening? Just, just go to the police. Just report that HH store this and that and that, and I'll be happy to go to the police to answer and take me to court. When I saw nobody was coming forward, I even offered a three-bedroom house. I'm glad some of you still remember. Three-bedroom house. That house is still there. No one claimed it. It's there. And I decided to put no tenant. It's just there sitting, waiting. <laughs> so why can't my colleagues do the same? If they know they store nothing, why can't they do the same? The guilty are? Fellow citizens, I just want to give you encouragement that no matter the difficulties, no matter the challenges, we shall overcome. Working together, we shall overcome. One good season is what we need to produce more. Hmm? I won't challenge you. More Vingoma. Most of you don't understand. Only Tumbukas, us, will understand. We Tumbukas. More Chimanga. More Mbonye. More Mapokwe. One season. With irrigation, double crop, storage, we shall be okay. We're working on the fuel issue, vexing, because of so many factors outside our control, global prices, the currency issues, which we're looking at as well. We shall overcome, but we need to stand together. We shouldn't allow divisive behavior, calling out people to go in the streets, to ban buildings, to ban Simpson, to ban Zanako, to ban Bank of Zambia. What are you going to lead after the country is put down? In 2015, we actually in the UPND believed we won that election. And my members came to me and said, let's go in the streets. I said, no. No. Let's go, let's go to court. I said, no. The next election is closer. Let's prepare. 2016, we believe we won that election. I'm saying we believe. Please, understand the language. My member said, this time we are going in the streets. Whether you like it or not, HHS said, you are not going in the streets. When our time comes, we want to find buildings there so that we can use them to grow the economy. We petitioned, our petition was never heard. It was tense. I said, no one goes in the streets. That's who I am. You must check the records of people. Why would anyone want to go into office by inviting young people to go in the streets and beat people and kill each other? Who do you want to